in there tonight. Uh, no? Yeah. Well, I guess they, uh, they they sang the right song this morning because it is raining and quite hard. Yay! God answers prayer. Yes, God answers prayer immediately. Uh, no. It works. So, uh... Wow, I can't even hear it. Um, this morning, last week actually, we, we, we last couple weeks we talked... Um, We've been talking out of this book, um, 10. And if, 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 uh, if you don't have it yet, I would encourage you to get it. This book is absolutely incredible. It is life-changing. What? I just want to move this by so I can find it, but I couldn't. Um, I will give you, the, the author is Terry A. Smith. And um, it's a book, a pastor out of New Jersey who wrote this. Um, they got an incredible church. Um, also, really quick, if you guys, uh, if anybody does want to give, um, there's no, we don't take a formal offering because we're really not about, we don't want it to be like a business in church. Uh, it's one thing that kind of, I believe that if, if your heart is to give, then you'll give. Um, if you want to, we have offering envelopes on the table with pens as well. So um, if you'd like to, they're there. Um, we've been talking out of this book, and the last couple weeks we've been talking about growth, right? We've been talking about how... Um, Growing is an essential part of becoming a 10 in Christ, becoming a 10 in our lives. That the growth process is a must. It's something that we like, we want to skirt and kind of run away from. But if we do that, we will never actually become everything that God intended us to be. Because even though they're the hard times, they tend to be the times where we call the valley, right? We're kind of going down into the valley of the shadow of death and, oh no, we must go there. Because when we go there, we actually come out a stronger and a better person. And even more so, the people around us are able to see more of Christ in us. So this week, we go from growing, we're going to talk about acting. And I'm not talking about Hollywood acting, but we're going to talk about acting. So Luke 145 says this. This is our verse for today. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And this is Elizabeth talking to Mary when she had gone to see her and she had Jesus inside of her. And blessed, she's saying, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment. So it wasn't just that the angel of the Lord came. She actually believed that what was told to her would actually come to pass. And so she was blessed as a result of that. So this morning we're going to talk about acting. Okay, so first thing we need to realize is we need to be an actor. So what does that mean? Well, God doesn't just show up because we have a dream, right? We've been talking a lot in this book about dreams and how God wants us to have dreams and visions for our future, and God wants to give us these incredible dreams to do things that will change our planet. And he doesn't want to just do it for one specific person and say, hey, you're the it, you're the man, you're the person. He wants to do it in each of our lives. And if each of us would respond to God in that way, the sky is the limit as to what God could do in our lives. So... We can't, God doesn't just show up because we have a dream and because we're waiting for it to materialize out of thin air, right? God is a <coughs> magic genie that just, poof, it just happens. God typically chooses people who have, in some way, given something for him to work with, right? It's almost like you could say, hey, I would like you to paint a portrait of me. We could tell, we could tell a mirror that this morning. We'd like you to draw a portrait or paint a portrait. And he's going to say, okay, well... Can you give me a canvas? Could you maybe get me some some pens to, to, to write, you know, to, to do the painting with or the portrait? Could you give me some paints, right? You actually actually have to do something. You have to actually give him something to work with. We can't just go to God and expect that God has the canvas and all the tools and say, God, do it. God's gonna say, No, I'm waiting for you to give me something to work with. And a lot of times we sit there and we're waiting for God to do it for us. Because we actually want to arrive there without any pain. We want to arrive there without actually having to step on our feet and walk. We want to actually arrive there, and as I call it, I, you know, I envision getting a man stroller someday that's got, it's all, you know, pimped out, it's all good to go. You know, where you could just kind of have the, the cooler and you have the, right? We're waiting for God to just kind of push us along in the little stroller where we're all set to go. And then when we arrive, we want to take credit for it, right? We arrive and we're like, look at us, look what we've done. And God's like, what? So it doesn't happen that way. Because along the way in the process as we walk in this, there are many hurdles to overcome and walk over. There are many times that we actually have to do something to get past things. And as we do that, 
it develops character, it develops muscle, right? Sometimes we have to climb over something that's in our way, and that develops some serious muscle, right? And so as we climb over it, we get over it like, wow, wow, God, I'm, I'm stronger now. I could actually handle this. And before that happened, you were a person that was like always saying, God, I could never, I could never do this. This, no way. There's no way. This, there's no way this is possible. And so God says, okay, just keep walking, keep walking. He doesn't tell you, oh, you can do this. He's like, just keep walking. And eventually he's like, all right, let's go. And you kind of fight him. No, God, I don't want to do it. But you start doing it step by step. And as you take those steps, you begin to find the reality of God in your life. And it becomes more alive to you. And you begin to actually believe for the unbelievable. Right? You begin to believe for things that you always in the past said could never happen, but as you begin to see that you can actually step over these things, you're like, hmm, maybe that is possible. Maybe I could do that. So it's important that we act. So we're going to use this morning, we're going to use Mary, Jesus' mother, as a model for creating God's pref uh, preferred future. Right? We've been talking about God's preferred future for us. That God has a preferred future, but we must act. We must walk in accordance with his will in order to get to that future. Because we could easily say, well, God, I'm good enough, I'm talented enough in this area, and we go towards it, and God could be off going, no, 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 I'm over here. But we decide to say, no, no, God, I, I know better. I know what's right. I'm going this way. And before long, I mean, it may even start out great, oh, this is awesome, but before long you realize it's a dead end. And then you actually have to backtrack and come back and find where, God, where you left God. Right? We talked about last week, God's at that fork in the road. When you left him and you went and did your own thing, he's still waiting there for you. He's waiting there with patience saying, okay, I'll wait for them to come back. And we need to realize that when we get God's, God's preferred future for us, it is the most fulfilled, the most amazing, the most wonderful future we could ever have. It is a 10 out of 10. So, first of all, the Bible says there are five steps to this. And I found this incredible because I, I had read this passage, and I'm sure each of us have read it. But when the stuff that was brought out as I read the book, I was like, wow, this is amazing. First of all, Mary was willing to wonder. Luke one twenty nine talked about she was filled with wonder. Did it not, is that not what it says? She was filled with wonder. So you got this little tiny teenage girl, probably 12, 13 years old, who an angel comes to. Okay, She's not married, and in those days that was a big frown upon. You get pregnant before marriage, you're likely to be stoned to death. Okay, So this was a big no-no, but yet the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, hey, you're going to carry the Son of God. And instead of her being like, get out of my face, I don't want anything to do with this, she begins to wonder. She begins to remind, you know, the imagination starts to stir. Who could this be? What could this child do? What is he going to do? What is, it, what is this baby going to look like? She begins to wonder. She begins to fill her mind with that. And I'm sure she was freaked out, right? Like I said, she was 12 or 13. If this angel shows up in your room, okay, for those of you who are not married and don't have kids and all that, if an angel were to show up in your room tonight and say, hey, you're going to have a baby. You might be a little bit like, uh, okay, I'm hallucinating. Mm, what's going on? Maybe it was the too much coffee I drank. Something, right? But the problem was she, not the problem, the, the blessing that came about it was that she was filled with wonder. And instead of allowing that moment to literally freak her out and cause her to go the opposite way, she allowed that moment to turn wonder in her mind. Because she wondered, she was open to that possibility, right? That was the first step. Because she was willing to wonder about what God, the angel Lord, had told her, she, her mind was then open to the possibility of having the Son of God. That immediately turned, it was the, that moment, that moment was the moment where she was like, okay, well, maybe this could work. And sometimes when God does something in our hearts, we have that moment and we're like, we instead go, no, 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 that's not me, God, that's beyond me, I couldn't do that. And we shut God down at the first step. Boom, no way. And so we end up living a life and we get frustrated. We're like, God, I, I'm so un, you know, unfulfilled in my life. And God's like, yes, because I asked you to do this. Go back and do this first step. Begin to wonder, to dream about what I want to do. And watch what happens. Secondly, she was willing to hear. She didn't immediately shut off this angel. Luke 1, 34 to 37 said she, was, she listened. She listened to what the angel had to tell her. She did ask questions, the Bible says. If you read through this, she asked, how is this going to be? I'm a virgin. How could this happen? She asked questions. She sought clarity for what the angel was saying. She didn't throw it offhand, 
she was looking for a clarified answer. She was like, okay, you're telling me this, so how is this going to happen? Lay it out for me here. But she listened. And the angel of the Lord gave her clarity, put her mind at ease, because she was willing to, first of all, wonder and listen. But she also, the Bible says, she was willing to say yes to God's dream for her. Luke 1.38. Think about this, okay? This is a girl who was betrothed. She was engaged. And she's engaged to this guy. Now, can you imagine the kind of thoughts that must run through her mind? Oh my gosh, I'm going to be pregnant. This guy who's engaged to me, according to Judaic law, has two options. He could either take me, and there's shame accorded, uh, associated with that if people find out I'm pregnant, or he has the right to throw me out to the city and have me stoned by the elders. You, could you imagine go, what's going through her mind at that moment? Not to mention the fact that she's probably like, no, seriously, dude, I had this mapped out for my life. Man, I was going to be the best fill in the blank. I was going to do whatever with my life. It was going to be awesome. And you know what, Joseph, he's going to be a carpenter. So we're going to make a lot of money together. We're going to do all this amazing stuff together. But instead, she was willing to say, okay, God, I may have my own dreams, what I think I want to do, but I'm willing to listen to where you're going. What you're telling me that you want to do in my life, let's do it. Are we at that place this morning? See, she had to say yes to participate. That's a crucial point in our lives, the same as with hers. God will give us these dreams, but we have to say yes in order to participate. God's not going to force it on you. You actually have to say, yes, God, I'm going to do it. And then when you say yes, then God says, okay, let's do this. And it's interesting because if you think about it, maybe it was at that moment that she conceived and gave with, in, with Jesus inside of her. The moment she said yes, more than likely, was the moment as soon as she said, okay, let's do this, that God said, okay, boom, it's done. And she became pregnant. You may have your own dreams for your future, but are they God-approved? If he says, go the other way, will you? And I think that's a really important point that we each have to search our hearts and know. Is what God is telling us, or what we believe God is telling us, is it, is it really God? Or are we kind of doing our own thing? And if God were to say, hey, you're going this way, go this way, are we willing to stop ourselves in midstream and do what God has asked us to do? Even if it means doing a complete 180 from what we believe we are supposed to do. Right? Are we willing to do that? Because I'm going to tell you something. If, this is another point. Each of these steps, we have a choice to walk away. And if we choose not to say yes for the dream that God has for us, we could be somewhat happy. We could have maybe good things in life. But I don't know about you. Do you want to live or a 5 or 6 or a 7 out of 10 in your life? When you go to your deathbed, do you want to be able to say, hey, I lived a 5, man. I was halfway there and I had a decent life. It was okay. I mean, we took a few vacations. We did a few things. It was nice. Really? Wouldn't you want to be in your deathbed with a smile dying with a, a grin all the way up to your forehead? Saying, I had the most amazing life that anyone could ever have lived. You couldn't convince me otherwise. And you asked my family. We had a blast together. It was awesome. I don't know about you, but that's the way I want to die. I want to die with a smile on my face saying, I lived at 10. So that means that I've got to be willing to temper my dreams and say, oh, God, what is it that you have for me? And be willing to say, if God says do this, if it's something I don't want to do, I need to be willing to do it. The fourth thing is, she was willing to be pregnant with the future. The, probably the most difficult time, and those of you who have had children would attest to this, is gestation. It's the whole pregnancy. It's the 10 months of being pregnant. It's that time where you have the morning sickness. right? Mary was pregnant with Jesus, but I'm sure there was not like, poof, you're going to have the best pregnancy that any woman has ever had. I'm sure there were mornings she woke up and was throwing up and was like, God, I can't believe you, right? You did this to me. She couldn't do it to Joseph. It was probably to God, right? The Holy Spirit. You did this to me. So those moments of during the gestation, she's having, and this wasn't an easy, this wasn't God pregnant and boom, she gave birth the next day. She had to walk this out. She had to walk this whole gest, and the worst, and the, not the worst, but the most interesting part of this is she couldn't be seen pregnant. She had to go into hiding. So not only that, she had to adjust her routine, her daily schedule, because if someone in public had seen that she was pregnant before she got married, there'd be serious questions. She could have brought dishonor to Joseph and in the entire family. 
So could you imagine she's suffering in silence by herself? Kind of hidden off. No one else can really see what's going on, except for a select few people. Does anybody feel like that? Sometimes you have a dream or something in your heart that God has given you, but you kind of feel like you're kind of hidden at the moment, and no one sees what you're suffering through. No one knows the times you're beating your pillow up because you don't want to punch a hole in the wall, and you're so frustrated, and you're so angry, and you're like, God, is this ever going to happen? Right? And those of you who, like I said, who have had kids, you get to that point where you're like, is this baby ever going to come out of me? Right? So we need to be willing to understand that that time, and in our, in our own spiritual lives, in our lives as we walk this out in God, this time is a tough time, this time of gestation. But it's the time when God puts things in us. But only we really know what's going on. We feel alone sometimes, and it's a huge price. But Mary was a virginal teen. She was pregnant with the future and ready, if necessary, to lose everything, and she almost did. She had to be willing to risk even her life, right? If people found out she was pregnant, she could get stoned. She had to be willing to risk everything to carry this dream, to carry this promise inside of her. Are you at that point? Because I'll tell you something. If, it's, if you're not at that point, then you need to really see, is this really a dream? Because if this is really a dream that God has, because if you're at the point where you're really willing, look, I'll give up everything to do this. Pursue it. But if you're like, yeah, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I really could go there. Then if you're wishy-washy, don't do it. There's no sense in getting your head chopped off for nothing. Go forward only if you know it's everything that God has for you. And lastly, Mary was willing to give birth. She was willing to give birth. She gave labor. She had labor in a stable with smelly, disgusting animals, with smells that must have grossed anyone out. A dirt floor, hay, all over the place. Who knows if she had allergies, right? Hay, she's far from home. <laughs> so she's far from home, far from the comfort of probably her mom, who would have given her comfort, even her cousin Elizabeth. She didn't have anybody. It was just Joseph, her, and the smelly, poopy animals all over the place, right? And she's giving birth, the most intimate and probably even most painful time for a woman where she would need comfort and all she has are animals around her. But it's interesting because I remember when my wife was pregnant and we were serving at the Korean United Methodist Church. And I got to tell you, they serve kimchi. And anybody that have kimchi, it is the spice of life, man. It is awesome. <laughs> and um, it's this pickled cabbage thing. And in Korea, they take it and they put like cayenne, all these peppers, and they put it in the ground and let it pickle. And they serve it with every meal. It's kind of like a, a family-style thing they put in the middle of the table and everyone can take some. But it's really, really good. Now, my wife doesn't think it's really good. I think it's amazing. But the thing was, is the garlic that was in it and all the spices, when I would eat it, I would come home and I was aromatic. I was a walking kimchi factory. So my wife, having a sensitivity to smell during her pregnancy would immediately run to the bathroom and throw up the second she would smell the kimchi on me. To the point where she said, no more kimchi for you while I'm pregnant. So I was, I, we had a little... I couldn't even go to church. She couldn't even go to church. The whole church smelled of kimchi. But the, the interesting part was, even the, even the Korean women would say, when we're pregnant, we can't handle it either. So it wasn't just her. But I was also known for even the Korean people would say I ate more kimchi than anyone humanly possible. So they were like, wait a minute, this isn't a meal. And I'm like, yes, it is. So, so needless to say, it would come out of me for days. So I couldn't do that. So I understand the whole, I understand the concept here where when it, when it really smells, I mean, she's going through all this and it smells. And she's willing to give birth. We, we too often miss the balance between divinely connected, or I'm sorry, divinely conceived, and we mu what we must do to bring it to life, right? We believe that the dream that God has given us is divine, right? We believe God has given us the dream. But we don't have a proper balance between that dream and what we must do to participate to make it happen. Because a lot of times we're like, oh, but we, we don't want to try and make it happen on our own, Right? Because spiritually speaking, we, we get very over-spiritual, like, oh, well, that's God. I mean, it's God's thing. We don't want to do anything to mess with it. And God's up in heaven going, no, I don't want to do anything to mess with what needs to happen. You do it. And he's waiting for you to start stepping halfway so he can meet you there 
and the divine plan can happen for your life. The Bible says in James 2.17, this is a very often quoted scripture, faith without works is dead. If we're not willing to put action or feet to our faith, then do we really have faith? And if we have a dream or faith for what God wants to do in our lives, and we're going to say we have, a, we have faith for that dream, do we really have faith if we're not willing to take action on it? It may be huge. I mean, God may have called you to start something like a business that is just huge. But you know what? Everything starts out as a seed. So we've got to be willing to at least plant the seed in the ground. We've got to at least be willing to water it. We've got to at least be willing to nurture what God has given us. Because I'll tell you something, if God has something incredible for you, why would he make something awesome in your life if you can't even prove faithful with a little seed? Why would he want to give you this giant tree, you know, a money tree, right, blessing? Why would he want to give you that if you can't even be faithful with a little tiny seed that he's given you, the little tiny mustard seed? This, and we gave those out, remember, at the retreat, the little tiny, tiny, tiny mustard seed. If you can't be faithful with that, why would he give you a full-grown tree? Full-grown blessing, full-grown dream for your life. Why would he do that? Because all he'll know is that seed will just get tossed. And the blessing that he gives you will get wasted. You have to go through the preparation time. Darren Miller said, God has given us the unfathomable privilege of being co-creators with him. Man, made in God's image, is given the awesome task of bringing forth all the potential of creation. History is open also. God, angels, and men can intervene to change its course. We have been given the opportunity as believers in Christ to change the course of our history and the history of our world. We can participate in an ongoing creative process that God has given us the ability to create. And if we will not create, then who will? Right? Should we leave the creative aspect of things to the people in the world, the people who don't know Christ? Should we leave it just to them? Or should we participate and say, look, let us dream big. Let us go after the things that God has for us in our lives. Mm -hmm. Don't sit around and wait for history to happen to you. Because it's one or the other. You're either going to make history or history is going to happen to you. I'd rather be the one making history. Because at least at that point, I can control with God how the thing happens. When history happens to you, it's just something that's happening to you. It's coming at you. Let's participate in what God is doing with, for us. Be an actor, not a victim. We need more than a dream. We need an actionable plan. So that's where it's going from here. It goes from, let's act, but okay, now we need a plan. Plan strategically. Have fun in it and be creative. A strategic plan has... First of all, a statement of mission, a vision, core values, prioritize strategic objectives, goals on a timeline, and a plan to monitor and measure results. Now, some of you may not be as anal as that, where you have things charted and graphed and mapped, but write some things out. Write some objectives out, the mission, some values, some goals, some things out, something to shoot for. And don't just write out, you know, hey, I want to do this little tiny small thing. Start small and then start make some really big objectives, right? If you're going to open a drugstore, don't just say, hey, I want 10 customers. Maybe start there and then say, you know what, in six months, I want to have 5,000 customers. In a year, you know, whatever it would be. Dream big. Make the goal big. Because you know what, if it's something you can achieve on your own, then God is not going to be in it because it will all be you. But if it's something that only God can achieve through you, then God puts his hand on it and you and him work together and make this incredible tapestry take place. And not only does it bless you, but it blesses others around you. So we need to plan, be strategic about it. So we talked about being an actor. Secondly now, let's talk about being the miracle. We are all created to be miracles. You must act to make your own history. You can't wait for things to be perfect before you take action, right? And many of us, I mean, I've done the same thing. Well, Lord, it's just not the perfect time. And as anybody knows, is there ever a perfect time? No, it never happens, right? I want to wait for a day that everything just goes completely right the whole day. Is that ever going to happen? No, it's not. And so as a result, if we continue to use excuses like that, we're never going to get anywhere. We need to be willing to say, okay, well, I've got this block of time today. Well, I'll at least make it happen now. Okay, well, tomorrow... Well, I got all these things, and then you walk through tomorrow, and you're like, hey, I got this time. 
let me do this. And you become strategic in saying, you know what, I'm going to put action to this and I'm not going to use the lack of time as an excuse. Let things be perfect enough. Let it be good enough. Let it be that it doesn't have to be completely, utterly perfect for you to do something. Let it be perfect enough. And at some point, you must decide to execute. You must decide, let's do this. Let's go forward. Because you can continue to use every excuse, but you need to learn to execute. Because success flows from action. Success flows from action. You're never going to be successful if you sit on your butt all the time. It just won't happen. Not unless you, by chance, win the lottery. But even then, you've got to get off your butt and go to the store, right? Unless someone goes for you. But, <laughs> you know, it's still, you, you, any success has to come with action. Um, even love has to be acted upon to be experienced, right? You could, if you say you're in love with someone, does that mean you're just going to sit there and wait for them to love you back, or are you going to actually actively love them? You actively love them. C.S. Lewis, and he's, he's one of my favorite authors, and um, he, he had this quote that was awesome. He called love an act of the will. And he said this, Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Just act as if you did. When you behave as if you love someone, you come to love them. Stop theorizing about love and start doing love. The same thing in our lives. Don't just, don't talk about it. Don't just do it. Behave. If you believe you're a CEO, behave as though you are one. I don't mean bossing people around, but I mean carry yourself with integrity. Carry yourself like, hey, I am somebody. Believe in yourself. Why? Because you eventually, you convince yourself that you are one. And when you convince yourself that you are one, you will convince other people around you that you are one. So much so that when you go for an interview with someone for a CEO position, you'll have no problem convincing them, this is who I am. Because I'll tell you something, nobody running a big company or any company at all would want to have someone walk in going, well, you know, I just don't know about myself. You know, I have good qualities, but I'll tell you, there's a few things that I just, I don't know if I can get past and I hope you could deal with them. I, you know, I can lead somewhat, but when people really get in my face, I just don't handle it well. I punch the last guy off the day. You know, what do you think is going to happen in that interview? They're going to be like, hey, the door's over there. Why don't you go take a look at it? Slam. Get out. But if you walk in there and you're confident, you know who you are, you just like, this is who I am. This is what I believe. They believe it too. And even if you don't get that job, you may have convinced them that you believe that, and they're going to be like, listen, and you got everything going for you. I'll call you if something comes up. That's what happens. When you have that kind of a mentality, we need to learn to believe that. We need to learn to take things and act as though it already was, right? You may not be a millionaire yet, but you need to act as though you are blessed. So what do you do when you're blessed? You bless others. You take care of others. You're abundant with other people, right? With whatever way you can do it. And so in that case, you need to act as though you're already blessed. Don't sit there and say, well, I don't have money. I don't have this. I don't have that. Act as though you do. And when you do that, you enable God to do more in you and through you. Because God will see that you're faithful with little. Because there's no excuses in you. You are blessed. Right? Who wants to hang around with someone who's always like, oh, I don't have any money. I just can't do this. And I don't know. I mean, it's either that. You know, if I do that, then I'm going to be feeding my family dog food. I don't, you know, right? Who wants to hang around with that person? Wouldn't you rather, oh, Vinny does. Who'd want to hang around with the person there? Or would you rather hang around with the person that says, listen, I may not have a lot of money, but I can do this for you, I can do that, I can, you know, I can do this. What did Peter and John do when they came to the temple? The gate beautiful. What did they do when they saw the person who was handicapped laying on the ground? Silver and gold have I none. But what we do have, we'll give you. They could have easily said, look, man, we're busy, we're on our way to church, get out of my face, we really don't have any money to give you. But the, what they said was, look, we don't have any money to give you, but we see that you're sick. We can see there's something going on in you. They took the time to see it. And so what did they say? Okay, we don't have any money, but you know what? Even better, get up and walk. And the guy got up and went, whoa, seriously? And boom, took off. He was walking. He was running. He was, the Bible says he was walking and leaping and praising God. Right? It was all because they gave what they had. And it blessed this guy. Can you imagine him going home and his family going, who is this? So now the blessing wasn't just for him, the blessing was for his family. So, don't just dream. Practice active dreams. Start to act on what you dream for. 
then they will manifest in your life. Paul did pray, and he, pr he prayed a prayer in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 11. He talked about praying that people would experience all that God had for them, that they would be blessed, and that they would walk in that blessing. See, Paul assumed that every good purpose of theirs that they were doing at the time was God-inspired. And their actions then, as a result, would be God-inspired. So if you believe that what God has called you to do is God-inspired, if the dream that you have is God-inspired, then you need to pray and just believe that what you're doing God is sanctioning. It's good to go. I'm not talking about going crazy and doing stupid things, but I mean, if you're doing and you're acting it out and you're going towards it, you just need to believe that it is God. And you need to believe that until you see a wall in the way or a door closed that God is saying, stop. Right? You keep going. And through all of this prayer, we've said this several times through this book as we've been doing this, prayer is crucial. It's key. We should pray not just about what's happening around us, but also about the action we're taking, right? Especially when the actions that we've taken have put us in a place where we need a miracle from God. If you believe God has called you to start a store, and you go and buy a building that's $500,000, and you've got $10 in your bank account, but you believe it's God, and you have people saying, no, this is a dream from God, go for it, then it's going to take a little prayer, right? You're not going to be going like, oh, Lord... You know, I don't know. You're going to be getting after it, right? God, I got a $500,000 building that I can't pay for. You, you know, I took these steps of faith. I need you to show up. I need you to come in here. This needs to happen because I believe this is you, right? It's not at that point in time for, God, could you just show up, please? It would just be wonderful. We could just really have a great time together. Is, are those the type? I'm sorry. But when we started this church... The kind of prayers that were prayed were not like, oh, Lord, please just help us. It was, Lord, we need a miracle. Mm -hmm. And right now, the prayers we're praying about finding a building are, Lord, we need a miracle. We need you to show up because we don't have the finances and the ability to get this grandiose building or even a building that would you know, allow us to grow or anything. We, we don't know what we could do. But it's a matter of saying, Lord, we're taking steps that we believe of faith. We need you to answer those steps of faith. That's what it is. It's saying, Lord, I'm taking steps. I'm taking action towards this faith. Now it's your turn. You need to show up here. And you know, some people say, oh, you can't pray to God like that. I would beg to differ. The Bible says you are to come boldly before the throne of grace. Not like a wimp. You need to know who you are and you need to come boldly. You need to know what you're asking and you need to articulate it to God and say, Lord, we need a building. We're taking steps. We're making phone calls. We've inquired. We need you to show up and open up a door for us. Lord, I'm believing, I'm opening a business. I need you to bring in customers. I am believing you for this. And it's not a matter of wimpy prayer. It's a matter of getting after it and saying, Lord, this is what's going on. And going after it in prayer. We need to create a need gap in our lives that is ever widening because we're acting in faith. Do you understand what I, what I mean by need gap? What it means is you're taking bigger and bigger steps of faith which create greater and greater need, right? You may start out and say, hey, this is a $100 bill. I got $10 in my bank account. Well, that could be doable, right? Do a fundraiser, you got the money. Next time, it's a $10,000 bill. Fundraiser, but even more fundraising. Next time, it's a million dollars. Oh, Lord, okay, this is huge, right? It's an ever-widening gap because what you do then is you're taking faith and putting it into action. And you're saying, God, you need to show up. And you're allowing God to show up. Because your faith is big enough for him to fit. Right? If you were to go to God and say, Lord, I have $10 in my bank account and I need $100, could you provide $90? is not that kind of insulting? I mean, yeah, he'll do it. But wouldn't you rather dream big and say, God, I need this. And allow God to show up and show his mighty hand and do something incredible in your life. And do something that shows up and people are like, whoa, you don't have the money to do that. How did you do that? All oh, it was God. He provided. Right? We heard the story from um, Tommy Barnett, how they opened a hospital in Los Angeles near um, Skid Row. Was it Skid Row? Near the, um, the area where it's really bad in Los Angeles. And he bought this tower. And the tower they were selling for millions and millions. And he walked up and I think he said, look, I'll give you four, four and a half million dollars for the building. They were, they were looking for like 15 or something like that. And the guy's like, sold. He was quick to be like, here, take the building. He didn't have any money in his bank account to buy the building. But he took it on faith because the dream for the building was greater than the fear of not having money. 
And what happened? In one day, he had a guy who had a son come up and each donate $2 million. <laughs> with unsolicited, didn't ask him for the money, they came up and said, we believe God has called this, boom, here's some money. God will provide for your dream if you step out in faith. The greater the risk, the greater the need, the greater dependence on God. Mm -hmm. The less of you is involved, the more of God is involved. Don't pray as a victim. Pray as a victor. Mm -hmm. Pray as a victor. Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about all these people that by faith they did this. By faith they did it. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was barren. An angel of the Lord came and said, hey, you're going to have a kid. And she's like, seriously? At first she didn't believe him. But then they took steps of faith towards it. They allowed themselves, and you know what I mean by steps of faith, towards it. So, they got pregnant. She was old. And she got pregnant. The, the dream came alive. But the thing was, if they hadn't taken steps of faith towards that dream, they would not have had their son. Now, along the way, they didn't believe God enough, and as a result, they had their Ishmael. But isn't it amazing how even though they had their Ishmael, they went beyond God's will, that God still blessed them? God still, no matter where you've gone in your life, if you've gone down different avenues and you're like, God, I don't want to, I'm going this way, I'm going that way, God still will bless you if you're willing to turn around and do it His way. Isn't that awesome? Like, it's not about us. God's already done the work. He's just waiting for us to obey. And even if we've rebelled for 50 years and we come back to Him, the blessing of God is still waiting there for us. We don't deserve it. You're right, we don't. It's all about His goodness and all about His grace and how awesome He is. And that's what's so great about it. We can't take credit. And to me, that's so relieving. Because then it's the pressure's not on me to fulfill it. The pressure's on me to just take steps of faith. Mm -hmm. The pressure is really on God to fulfill his promise. Mm -hmm. All he requires of us is taking steps of faith. Man, that, whew, no sweat on us anymore. Man, that takes the pressure right off. God gives us the dream. So it's on him. He gives us the dream. Then he just requires us to take some steps of faith. And then he fulfills it. That's pretty sweet. That's a sweet deal. I'll take it any day of the week. The thing that he's asking for, though, is are you willing to act it out? Are you willing to act out this dream and your faith in the dream? So, the Bible says in our faith, there is times for waiting, right? But as we wait, God responds to us as we start doing. Isaiah 40, 31. For those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. That is a promise to you this morning. If you step out in faith, you will not grow weary. You will not faint. You will not, because the strength of the Lord will uphold you. You will fly on his wings over your problems, over your stuff, and he will take you and lift you up over it. You will begin to see your problems through his eyes and how small they really are, and you will be able to conquer everything in your way. This morning, you are the miracle. God wants to use you, and you can create the future. Stop sitting around and waiting for someone or something to do it for you. It's time to take action to make our world and God's world more like he planned it to be in our lives. I believe this morning as during worship, I really believe I got something in my heart from the Lord for us, which was, I believe the Lord very simply said, I'm doing a new thing. Learn to perceive it. Learn to see it. If we could learn to change our perspective, we could see what God has for us. And if we can learn to do this, God will explode in us and do new things. How many of you this morning want to be a 10? Want to have God explode in you and do everything in your life that he promised? And so this morning, as I close in prayer, I'm going to ask you to do that and surrender it to God. The dreams, the desires, the stuff in your heart, the stuff that you didn't believe and still don't believe that are going to come to pass. You had this dream and you're like, eh, it's just too bad. Give it to God this morning. And what I'm going to ask is that when I'm praying that you would surrender to God, and then I want you to, in your mind, say, Lord, I'm going to walk this out. I'm going to take steps forward. I'm going to do what you called me to do. And if there are those in this place that don't know the Lord or are struggling with God and really are just like, ah, I don't know, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you really feel tugged in your heart like you want to pray it, just pray it in, in your heart to the Lord. And just say, Lord, come into my heart because I believe he will, and he wants to do great things in you. I am so excited for the future God has for this church, but for the people in it. I'll be honest, 
church doesn't tickle me. The people in the church do. What God wants to do in your lives excites me more than anything. In a couple years from now, when I'm seeing each of you explode into destiny, explode into things that are mind-boggling, I'm going to be your biggest cheerleader. I'm going to be your biggest fan. I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And I can't wait to see it. So my heart would say this morning, please don't hold God back. Don't sit down and wait for God to do it. Get up off your butt and take steps forward towards God, towards the dream. Make it alive. Make it happen. I and Sandy, we will do everything we can to help you. But ultimately, it's up to you to do it. Allow God to do these great things in your life this morning. Lord, this morning, I thank you that you can even use me to articulate your word, Lord. And Lord, I know that this morning went a little long, but I do ask, Lord, this morning that you would just challenge each of our hearts. Lord, challenge our hearts to not sit down and wait. Wait for you to act, or wait for you to come alive, for our dream to finally just poof, magically appear. I pray, Lord God, that you would challenge each of our hearts this morning, Lord God, as we surrender our dreams to you. Lord, we surrender first and foremost all of our dreams. But secondly, Lord God, this morning, we say to you, we are going to act on what we believe you've given us. We're going to go forward, and we're not going to delay. We're going to go forward. Despite the pain and the times and the, the stuff that it's going to take to get there, we're going to do it. And we're going to see your dream for us realized. Just as Mary did, Lord God. Lord, all she did was say yes. And when she said yes and acted and obeyed, you did the rest. Lord, let us learn to walk out the dreams that you have for us. Because, Lord, they're so great and they're so huge. Lord, I pray that you would also, Lord, this morning, touch each and every heart. Lord, there, there, there may be some in here who don't know you. Or, Lord, there, they may have known you, Lord, in the past, or they may have had a, a time with you, Lord, but they've been walking away. And, Lord, this morning... We just come to you and we say, Lord, we're sorry. We repent for our sins. We ask that you would forgive us for the sins and that you would cleanse us from every dirty thing in our lives. We receive you as our Lord and as our Savior. And we ask you to come into our heart this morning. And so, Lord, I thank you that those who have prayed that prayer, Lord God, that you have made yourself alive in their heart and in their lives. And I just thank you for that this morning. Lord, bless your people. Lord, bless this time of fellowship. Bless the food. Lord, may it be edifying to you and edifying to each other. We just praise you for that in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and grant you his peace. And you're going out greater than when you came in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in the peace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Have a blessed week, and have fun at the brunch.